So the final session uh, was actually led by a non-academic, led by me, because the question I had going into this whole thing was, what, what emerges from this? How can this be helpful? How can this conversation be helpful to us? I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes that said something like, I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I give everything I own for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Um, in this conversation, we've introduced some things that may be considered to be introducing complexity. It's not as, maybe translation is not quite what we thought it was. But on the other side of that, is there something that's deeply meaningful and in some ways deeply simple and uh, that can change the way we experience sacred texts, that can change the way we experience our religious life. And so that's kind of what we try to get at in this final session. Um, so enjoy. Terrell, I'm a bit of a, sp I'm a, I'm a, bit of a splitter. I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, my um, experience with Mormon scripture and Mormonism in general is you, you sort of put, you, you sort of put the Book of Mormon on one, I have, on a little bit of one um, pedestal in terms of a, a subject of translation, but there's this broader idea of translation and it, that applies to other Mormon scripture and other things within Mormonism. And I want to just explore that real quickly before we dive into this. This is from the dictionary that was prevalent at the time of Joseph Smith's life, 1828, Webster's American Dictionary and how, he define, and how you define translation. And I think it was, what did translation mean to Joseph, and, Joseph Smith himself? We've talked about this. You'll notice that the, clear down at the bottom, the act of turning into another language or interpretation, that is the, that's, the, that's the definition that we normally associate with translation. That's down the list of ways uh, in the uh, dictionary definition. At the top is the act of, let's see, the act of, for example, the act of removing or conveying from one place to another, the removal of a person to heaven without subjecting him to death. So the idea that the Joseph might have a little bit different and a, a more expansive view of translation should not be surprising at all. And we've addressed that, I think, pretty well. And so I, I, wanted, to just do, I wanted to just do one thing. Can you hear me OK? This mic is not in the right place. Can I take it out? Oh, there you go. Why didn't somebody think of this before? <clears throat> um, Terrell, I'm a bit of a sp I'm a I'm a bit of a splitter. I'm I'm with you on that. Um, my um, experience with Mormon scripture and Mormonism in general is you you sort of put you, you sort of put the Book of Mormon on one I have on a little bit of one um, pedestal in terms of a. A subject of translation, but there's this broader idea of translation and it, that applies to other Mormon scripture and other things within Mormonism. And I want to just explore that real quickly before we dive into this. This is from the dictionary that was prevalent at the time of Joseph Smith's life, 1828, Webster's American Dictionary and how, he define, and how you define translation. And I think, it was, what did translation mean to Joseph, and, Joseph Smith himself? We've talked about this. You'll notice that the, clear down at the bottom, the act of turning into another language or interpretation, that is the, that's, the, that's the definition that we normally associate with translation. That's down the list of ways uh, in the uh, dictionary definition. At the top is the act of Let's see, the act of, for example, the act of removing or conveying from one place to another, the removal of a person to heaven without subjecting him to death. So the idea that the Joseph might have a little bit different and a, a more expansive view of translation should not be surprising at all. And we've addressed that, I think, pretty well. I guess my, my question to the panel after this preface is this you, expanding the definition of translation as we have today, how can it change the way we experience our Mormonism in a very practical way? How is it, how is it, how is it changed the way you engage the sacred text? And are there, I have a follow-up question to that, but I just want to open that up. 
can say something on that. I think um, once we have this basic idea that the work of translation is much broader than just scriptural, and that it's this notion of, of taking something and bringing it into a new context that makes it sacred, I think a lot of other things fall into place. And sort of self-servingly, I'll point to a project that I'm working on, and that's with something like the Proclamation on the Family. So we can see that, not scripture. Um, and you know, we could point it out and say, you know, this has all the marks of kind of um, one particular family form that was ascendant in the 20th century. And sometimes that move is then taken to say, well, if we can see traces of that in the text, then it, then it can't be inspired at all, right? This, this, this really can't be um, inspired. This is just cultural, you know. But with this larger understanding, we can see this as just another example of Joseph Smith, or, or of Mormonism, not Joseph Smith, but of Mormonism, um, kind of looking around the environment that it's in and finding ways to translate and sacralize the objects that it finds around. So it shows us how we can take this model of the nuclear family, right? Very contingent and historically specific, but even a model like that can be made um, a vehicle for salvation, a vehicle for community making. So I think that's one concrete way that this mo model of translation can help us make sense of, of Mormonism in the present day. So did, did Joseph model this some, something, some sort of spiritual imagination that we can incorporate into our practice, our engagement with texts? Did he model something that we can take as an example and kind of an invitation in our own lives? I guess that's, that's the question. When Alexander Campbell, Joseph Smith's contemporary and near, near neighbor, uh, wanted to teach religion. He created a book of systematic theology and ethics where he laid out the principles of the gospel and said, uh, this is how we should live it. When Joseph Smith wanted to do it, he presented it with a historical text, which the angel said contained the fullness of the gospel. A series of stories, a series of characters, the movement of a civilization. Somehow or other, Joseph is saying over and over again, we learn about how to be godly by looking at other people's experience, other historical people's experience. And I think we should take these texts very seriously and read ourselves into them. Uh, the, the principle of liken the scriptures unto yourselves, I, I think is that means that we have to, in a way, write the story that Joseph Smith gave us the framework for with our own selves as characters in it. This is what our kids are doing in seminary all the time. You can't just set down principles, you do this, you do this, you do that, but it's much more effective to become part of the past, read ourselves into the past, and then learn what the, the present should be. Well, after both of those very beautiful and selfless answers, I have an entirely narcissistic one, <laughs> which is um, there is one of the essays in that forthcoming volume from University of Utah Press is one that I can't quite stop thinking about, and it's about um, it's by Thomas Wayman and Haley Wilson, neither of whom I've ever met, but it's about Joseph Smith systematically consulting Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible in creating the um, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And it's, it's very groundbreaking scholarship to my knowledge. No one has done this before, looked at this particular really influential commentary from the 1820s, and then looked at exactly the changes that Joseph Smith made and seeing they are lining up almost exactly in many instances, including very idi idiosyncratic things that are a little unusual about the JST. The reason that I bring this up is that I left that reading experience feeling elevated as a scholar, that even though this is not what I do, um, maybe this is bricolage, but Joseph Smith was taking the very best that was available to him 
and calling it, claiming it for Mormonism in the way that that famous Brigham Young quote says, you know, wherever there is truth, I claim it for Mormonism. And so in answer to your question, Bill, about what difference does this make, I think that an expansive view of translation elevates all of us. And it also calls us to be more, perhaps, than we already are. It's very, very easy for us to sit back and say, oh, that was Joseph Smith. Either because he was so inspired that God was doing all the work and he was simply the empty vessel, or because he was a genius. But either of those explanations uh, really puts it all on Joseph Smith. And I think that theologically, Mormonism has always been about the project of the sanctification of all of us. And in what sense are we able to participate in this grander project? That's what I wonder. Um, uh, as far as what I think, I think first and foremost, intellectually speaking, what this new model or whatever we want to call it, because as Rosalind also pointed out, there have been other people in the past who have also suggested, right, as, as some of the things that we're suggesting in different terms, but um, is that it provides a way of thinking about Joseph Smith's creativity as an asset rather than a liability, uh, I think, um, and, and, as a, and as an invitation to, um, yeah, theologize in different directions, right, and to, um, I, I don't know that all of us are, are as interested in theologizing as you are, but... <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that may be the case. But yeah, um, uh, uh, by, by theologize, I don't mean that, yeah, you're necessarily going to be writing your own version of Mormon doctrine, right? But I mean, uh, to, yeah, to put it in terms of sort of how this might cash out in terms of a religious practice, right? Um, maybe, you know, it, it, it makes us more active, right, in our, in our spiritual lives, that we get out of the posture of waiting right for yes. for you know inspiration to come from some other source right in order to direct us to where we're supposed to go maybe it means we um we think about consecrating our our lives right um in in new ways um we think about what we can do to make you know to to sanctify right to 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 make sacred experiences now i'm struck by uh, I mean, one of my favorite verses in scripture is in the book of Moses, one of Joseph Smith's translations, Moses 7-7. Seven, seven, the, the Lord says to, to Enoch, prophesy. Um, and then it, the next verse is, and Enoch prophesied. And then it gives the conscious, but the, this idea of, of God saying, do something, Enoch, prophesy. You know, come on, he's not telling him what to prophesy. He's saying, do it, you know, you know what to do, prophesy. And then Enoch duly prophesies. Um, I think this also comes up in an interesting way in, in Anne Tave's um, work, right? That um, even though, yes, yeah, some of the particulars of her account of the translation might be tough um, for a certain stripe of Mormon to, to countenance, I feel there's something deeply Mormon in the way that she gravitates to the brother of Jared example as sort of like her, uh, and it's another in, one of these instances, right, of, uh, uh, of uh, a human being, right, being put in the position by God of like, do something, yeah. prophesy, figure it out, so consecrate, it so consecrate it something, get those stones and, you know, bring them to me and make something happen, right? Um, so I think that that's one, what, one way in my mind, and, and intellectually but also practically, right, that, that a spiritual life might sort of, uh, and just an existence might be different on the other side of this sort of, um, uh, this sort of translation paradigm that we've been talking about. One of the motifs that has emerged again and again is, is uh, translation and history. And we, we, nobody's really pointed out that it's entirely conceivable that Joseph could have tried to recuperate any number of ancient kinds of texts, mm. right? moral codes or chakras or any number of things. But he recuperated histories. And I'm reminded of the saying of an, an ancient Greek poet who said many heroes there were before Agamemnon, but they had been claimed by the night because there was no bard, no sacred bard to tell their story. And uh, I like um, Jana's allusion to, to a kind of universalist bent, if I understood you correctly, um, in, in this, this scriptural production, because you know, one, of the, one of the morals of the Book of Mormon is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quest for Zion, 
that is perpetually deferred, right? You think you found it here, and then you found it here, and then it's relocated here. When we finally learn the moral of the story is there's no Zion place. There are only Zion peoples. And it seems to me that part of what we learn from Joseph's prophetic and translating production is that there is an inexhaustible store of other histories that are still out there for us to learn and appreciate and that uh, nobody lives in a corner too distant in the universe for God to be aware of, of them and, and their story. Terrell, I, or I, actually I wanted Richard, Richard, are you, how are you doing down there? Because when you said, when, when Jared said prophesy, I, it reminded me of a conversation that Richard and I had driving up here. Richard served as a patriarch, of course, and about a hundred times a year he was called upon to prophesy, and uh, in, in that sense, Richard, I wonder if you had any, have any comment on, um, or, you, or you cannot comment on this too, and pass it right on down if you wish, but uh, do you have any wisdom to share on this? You remind me of the name of the general authority I talked to, I never can remember it, Edward Kushuki. Kikuchi, it's Kikuchi, I think. Kikuchi. Um, Kikuchi. When I'd been a patriarch for about uh, oh, a year or so, uh, the, the visiting general authorities sat down with the two or three of us in the area who were patriarchs. They, they want to do that to make sure you're uh, st still compus mentis. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an occupational hazard of a job you can never escape goes on and on. And uh, he's a wonderful man, very deep person. And he said, you know, uh, brethren, the, the, the leaders of the church just have one mission message for you, and that is when you give a blessing, uh, give way to the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And that's very good advice because especially if you're a writer like I am, you want to edit your work, you want to make <laughs> sure you're handling all the possible objections to it, but you can't do that uh, with uh, if you're going to be a patriarch. And I think that that uh, really, as has been suggested here, uh, is, is counsel for all of us. Uh, Bill wanted to know, uh, how can you possibly give a blessing? And I said, anyone who has had any experience giving blessings to people has learned the art. It's something we're called upon to do in our, in our lives, just in our church routines, to receive or to give blessings. So we hear that language all the time. And I think uh, I, I'm with all of the people on this platform that that really is our, our calling, to, to speak. My wife says, you need to keep a journal. That's what Nephi did. And if you keep your journal, and then you go out and bury it in your backyard, <laughs> in 500 years it will turn to gold. <laughs> uh, did you have a comment, Phil? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Prophesy. <laughs> um, Joseph Smith's translations have to be translated. Uh, whether that's done through a secular lens, an academic lens, a religious lens, um, the, the uh, saying on the part of some Mormons is you don't get a pick and choose smorgasbord Mormonism, you have to take it all or reject it. What do you think that could possibly mean? If everybody is, everybody who looks at this um, phenomenon called Mormonism, uh, including believers, participants, or scholars, are translating it. They're accessing it somehow and doing something. And that can, um, if there's anything that you should have taken away from today, uh, if we're not brain dead, it would be that questions, helpful questions, fruitful questions, multiply either by your own imaginations or by engaging informed, imaginative people and, and getting new ways to access or think about um, problems. So, uh, so if you're going to be damned in a Joseph Smith sense of the word, which is to say be blockaded, not to be 
have divine lightning bolts thrown at you or fiery furnaces in the eternity, <coughs> but they, to be blocked, damned in becoming what you ought to become, um, you ought to do it by some fabulous great sin rather than <laughs> a failure of the imagination. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That is, that, that is really interesting because someone asked me once, I have some of my children here today, someone asked me once, what most I feared as a parent about being a parent? And I, I thought about it and I said, I guess that my kids might turn out boring. <laughs> That's not probably the typical answer, but one final, and I'm going to sit down, but one thing that I've, I've, I've gotten from this, Joseph Smith modeled something, it seems to me. He took things that came into his orbit, what, that came into his orbit or the, that were in his environment, and assembled them into, some, into something that was greater than the sum of the parts and transformative for himself and for other people. I think, Mormon, I think Mormonism invites us all to do that. And, and when we do that, it becomes an individual expression of creation for each of us, because the things that come into our orbit are all different. We all come from a different perspective, and so it becomes a uniquely, a unique creation using that sort of spiritual imagination that I think Joseph Smith modeled. That's way more a statement than it is a question, but I would, if anyone had any, if anyone wanted to respond to that, um, there's another discussion that's more of an institutional, like how we do this institutionally, but this is, this is, uh, I think good for the time being. If there are any other thoughts on that? I think we're ready to close, but I want to close with one reaction to that. Is yes. that all right? So I'll come over there. Um. My word, when I was thinking, um, I think sort of independently, but paying attention to what Terrell does, um, there might have been some sort of dialogue or unconscious dialogue, but Terrell knows that my word for his, his and Levi Strauss's um, bricolage, which is a more Frenchified, elegant term than the one I'm about to give you, is baraification. Um, that is, Joseph, as you know, um, theologized or claimed some sort of uh, revelation as a consequence, a highly interactive consequence of being taught some Hebrew by Joshua Sykes in Kirtland studying Hebrew. He came across uh, in Genesis 1 and 1 this uh, Hebrew word bara that means uh, to fashion, to organize, to shape as opposed to poof into existence, ex nihilo. Um, and therefore, Joseph's bricolage, um, the reason I choose the word baraification is that he was, um, in, by um, proceeding by way of bricolage, he was participating in the divine mode of operation as God creates not ex nihilo, but by um, shaping chaos and, and forming out of pre-existent materials. Um, so, so by indulging in bricolage, uh, Joseph Smith is doing a divine activity, and that would be a sort of um, a model that's out there for people to think about, um, Joseph Smith. Uh, so some of you are going to be desperately honoring what I'm about to do, and others of you may boo, but those in the latter category, please do it silently. Uh, and that is, I think it's time to end um, our day. Um, I hope you weren't texting during our sessions. I was telling you that I love you. Ah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm processing, which is translating <laughs> Sam Brown. I am pr I'm translating Samuel Brown right now, and that is an experience. Again, our thanks to both the Religious Studies Program, uh, the, the, including the History Department and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Faith Matters Foundation.
and um, uh, for you, for taking uh, many of you a whole day to be with us, that's a generous, uh, courageous act. And um, also, again, as I said earlier this morning, many of you who have um, contributed to the Religious Studies program uh, and or in the future the uh, Faith Matters Foundation for making um, explorations like this possible. So a final thanks to you and to our panel. <laughs>